Welcome to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with financial planner, speaker, and consultant Michael Kitsis to hear stories of how leading financial advisors navigated the inevitable challenges that arise on the path to success and get insight from leading industry consultants about how to break through to the next level in your advisory business. And now here's your host, Michael Kitsis. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 180th episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. My guest on today's podcast is Ryan Inman. Ryan is the founder of Physician Wealth Services, an independent RAA based in San Diego that serves over 140 physician clients. What's unique about Ryan, though, is the way he's gone all in on the niche of serving physicians, to the point of renaming his advisory firm, launching a financial residency podcast, and restructuring his entire financial planning process into inpatient and outpatient services, to the point that now in his fifth year of business, he's adding more clients every month than he added in his entire first year as a generalist. In this podcast, we talk in depth about how Ryan chose the niche of working with physicians, the mindset shift he had to go through to get comfortable narrowing the focus of his practice, how going to the FinCon Financial Bloggers Conference gave him the inspiration on how to actually market to and reach his niche, and how he's ultimately found that having a focus niche is making it easier to market because you don't actually need to reach a lot of people to get new clients when your niche marketing is focused. We also talk about Ryan's financial planning services themselves, his unique fee structure of charging clients either $500 a month or $833 a month, and those are his only two options, the unique expertise in student loan planning he had to develop to really serve his niche effectively, what he does for his clients up front and on an ongoing basis to earn those monthly fees, and why Ryan ultimately had to go outside of traditional financial planning software and to use tools like YNAB to actually help his clients in the areas that they needed advice most. And be certain to listen to the end, where Ryan talks about the importance of having your own financial foundation set before you launch your own firm and why he waited almost two extra years before going out on his own. Why, even though Ryan is glad he waited to launch his firm, he regrets not focusing into a niche earlier on. And how, if he could do it over again, the only thing he'd really change is finding a business partner sooner rather than later. Because in the end, it can be pretty lonely launching an independent advisory firm from scratch. And so with that introduction, I hope you enjoy this episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast with Ryan Inman. Welcome, Ryan Inman, to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Hello, sir. Thank you for having me on. It's going to be super fun. I'm I'm really excited about the the discussion today and and getting to talk a little bit about niches, which I granted is a, is a is a theme we do touch on with some regularity on the podcast, but I feel like you have you have gone sort of deeper and more focused than a lot of other advisors of really going sort of all in on a on a niche. And and I remember like when you were going out to launch the firm in its current state a number of years ago and kind of talking about like, should I really do this niche thing? Like, is it gonna work? I'm not sure. And and now like you are all in and having lots of growth and and just having fun even lo- like just browsing around your website and and all the ways that I can see very clearly it is built to speak to your niche audience of of working with physicians and so I'm I'm excited to sort of talk about this like evolution of a niche and what happens when you decide like okay I think I'm going to go for it and then you start doing things to go down that niche road and find where it takes you. So I, I feel like it's it's it seems to be even for you an evolving journey of quite what you're doing with this focus. Yeah, we change things, I feel like daily we're trying new things. And maybe that's the ooh shiny object syndrome that I kind of have where I want to test and keep helping people as much as I possibly can. And I mean changing up the podcast or, you know, doing something different in a Facebook group or you know, just even offering a potential new service because we get asked enough for it. We're constantly evolving and changing. But yeah, I mean, in the very beginning, Michael, it was terrifying. I mean, absolutely terrifying, right? Coming out with no book of business, no contacts, no idea how to market, no email list, nothing. And getting to, you know, launch and and launching with XYPN. And, you know, as I said you know, ahead of time, like I owe a lot to XYPN. I get frustrated sometimes with XYPN, but I owe a lot to XYPN because It helped me understand the power of a niche, but also, and I think this is the greatest gift, is 
I was able to find my partner in business, not my wife, but my partner in business, Casey Cress, who was an XY planning member, who we were introduced via an XY planning member. And now she's a partner here and absolutely like the foundation from how we're building more success because she's amazing. So, so I think to get us started, just paint a picture for us of the advisory firm as it exists today. Like what, what is the firm? What do you do? Who do you serve? Yeah. So we're obviously a fee only financial planning firm. I'm in San Diego. So we're, we're technically headquartered here. Casey, who I just mentioned is my partner is out of Connecticut. So she's on the wrong coast in case anyone needed clarification there. We're a full virtual firm. We have a life planner that works with us, which we can dive into into that more detail if you'd like. We have two other people uh, that work with us that are more admin back office. One of them is tr- going to be a junior advisor, hopefully this year. And then we serve physicians, um, specifically MDs and DOs. So we don't work with dentists or nurses. I mean, even more specialized, right? In healthcare is just a physician, MD or DO. And we work with them all across the country. So this is really what we set out to do is just provide the best education, the best platform, the best advice that we can for that specific audience. I feel like a lot of advisors over the years have said like, well, I, I work with doctors. I think that was one of the, you know, one, like one of the early niches for advisors because it, it it does tend to be a higher income producing profession. A lot of doctors, maybe more so in the past, like owned their own medical practices and were small business owners as well. And so just tended to have a lot of the sort of income and affluence that meant they had financial issues, financial complexity needed to hire financial advisors and. And therefore, we had advisors who said, well, yeah, I, I, I specialize in working with doctors. But I, I am still struck that just – I've seen advisors that say they work with doctors. I come and look at your website, which not coincidentally is called Physician Wealth Services. And just like I feel like what I see on your website looks completely different than what I see from other advisors who say, quote, I, I work with doctors. Yeah, I think part of that's – because I'm married to a doctor. So I, I get the terminology because I'm forced to get the terminology, if you will. Uh, we've been together 18 years now. Yeah, I think I think really it's, I'm friends with doctors. I'm married to a doctor. We only work with doctors. The, the message that we portray is that we are experts in this because this is all we do. I don't, I don't hang out with architects. I don't hang out with engineers. This is something that we truly focus on. I know the pains and joys of being in medicine or married to medicine because I literally live it every single day. So I think some of the terminology that comes through, I mean, Michael, I got caught at FinCon last year by someone that was like, I'm confused. Are you a doctor that turned advisor or are you a financial, like, how does that work? And I was like, I was kind of taken back because I'm like, I'm terrified of blood. So uh, definitely, not <laughs> money, definitely on the advisor side, not on the doctor definitely side. Money nerd, not actual like physician. Don't even pretend to be one. But I thought that was interesting because I speak the lingo so well. And it's just because I'm around it. And I, I, I just know what they're going through because I live that. So as we set off to, to really switch this marketing, if you will, from a website standpoint, you know, that was something that was really important to me is to make sure that they felt like they were home. When I'm struck, it's all the way through, like you've got this, you know, people can go to look at the website. This is episode 180. If you go to kitsis.com slash 180, we'll have links out to Ryan's website. I'm struck even just like on the homepage, you know, it just outright says like, we are a service tailored to physicians. You know, it could be helpful to understand financial planning as it relates to systems of the body. And like you've got what are basically medical drawings of like the digestive system and and says like this is like budgeting and cash flow and the cardiovascular system, like this is like your investments and the the renal system, this is this is your debt. If you you know can't excrete it and get it out, this isn't gonna go well for you. And like your insurance is your immune system. Just oh, you can't like, forget the, the, the way that you connect it. Michael. The and reproductive what was that? system, you can't forget it, right? The reproductive and the, system, and the reproductive system is your college savings. Yeah, there you go. Got to be super nerdy if we go in like that. 
and, and obviously to me, like on the one hand, like, I mean, like it's not rocket science to sort of like make some of these parallels. They're kind of straightforward for what they are, but just to me, it's one of the interesting things that happens when you really take a deliberate focus on saying, here's who we focus on. Here's what we're doing is like, you get to start just framing everything in a way that speaks to your your target audience. Like, you know, I know you you describe your services as first we diagnose, then we prescribe. So like a bunch of meetings about understanding clients' needs and goals and then making recommendations to implement. But, you know, you call it our diagnostic stage and our prescription stage. And, you know, you get a financial health assessment at the end because these are doctors and this is the kind of thing that that fits for them. Just I'm 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 so struck by it that this is what happens when you get really specific on a particular type of of clientele like it's not that we don't necessarily all as advisors like do these areas like budgeting cash flow and investments and insurance and debt management and college savings and we all have a process where we get clients goals and then we give them uh planning recommendations like ultimately some of the stuff may be the same but it does strike me if if I'm a physician and I'm coming here, just that phenomenon of like Ryan talks my language and like just puts things in terms that I understand because you put it in medical terms. That's what they live. So that's what they understand. Just it, it, to me, it so rings, rings through even down to like you, you know, as your primary financial care specialist, we do semi-annual checkups, right? Cause this is, this is language for physicians that I feel like from our end, sometimes advisors, we we think these things sound, I don't know, maybe hokey of putting language in those terms. But when it's actually targeted for you, to me, your your site just kind of screams, as you said from your conversation at, at at FinCon, like this guy lives doctors and gets doctors. Like he's he's one of us. If he's not literally a former doctor, like he's clearly part of our tribe. This is who I want to work with if I'm a doctor. Yeah, we've gone even as far as like naming. So in our ADV, it says inpatient planning, outpatient planning. Like we we actually still stick to to that. And some people are like, that's just cheesy. Like, I'm not going to do that. And that's totally cool. Like you're not the target audience, but the audience that comes here goes, oh, I get the difference between inpatient and outpatient, or I get the difference between the systems of the body. And I didn't realize that my immune system was like insurance, but now that connection is made. And the more connections we make, the higher probability of success that they're actually going to not only understand their plan, but they're actually going to implement the plan. And I try to keep that that theme, that conversation the whole time, right? I, I say like short of the overnight shift, we're on call, right? So you, we don't have typical hours and that that's okay with us because we I prioritize, truthfully, prioritize spending time with my kids. I do, well, in non-pandemic times, I should say, right? I'm doing the breakfast, getting them ready, taking them to school. I make sure I'm the one that picks them up from school. I spend time with them in the afternoon. The bulk of our meetings happen between 3 and 9 p.m. So I can work on, you know, on the business stuff during the day while they're there. I can spend some time with them. And then I have client meetings at night that are at a time that helps them the most. And part of this is, you know, and I know you allude to the the iceberg, right? Is if you only look and say, well, I'm only going to be, you know, meeting with clients at a certain period of time. Well, there's still a lot of work that has to be done. So, you know, on the surface, people see, oh, you do, you know, X number of, of hours, uh, you know, how is he doing that? But then in reality, there's a whole bunch of work that goes in behind it to get us to where we're at and the team and my partner Casey, like they are absolutely phenomenal. I mean, without them, this wouldn't be as successful as it, as it is and onboarding, you know, and helping as many clients as, as we can. So I, I think, you know, it coming back to the beginning, Michael, when, when I launched in 2016, it wasn't like this. It wasn't this niche focus. I didn't understand marketing, but I was terrified to actually call it a niche. I wanted to work with physicians. And when we actually met in, what was it, September or October, whenever XYPN was, and I, I sat you down, I said, hey, like I just launched, this is what it is. And looking at my current clientele, I only had eight clients in the first year. That was it. Like it was very slim. 
And this is, you know, something that people need to understand that if you're starting your own practice, like it doesn't happen overnight. But all eight of them were physicians, even though my website didn't say anything about physicians, the name didn't say anything. Like that was just who I naturally kind of were, were pulling in. And sometimes the niche finds you and sometimes you find the niche. So, you know, when we're talking about like a bunch of advisors that say they work with doctors, well, are they working with doctors? Because I mean, the, and I, I tell them all the time, like just on the podcast, like the financial industry isn't your friend. A lot of people listening are great people and excellent planners, but most people understand that physicians are super high income earning and have zero financial training. So they have a giant target on their back. And I'm not saying that people listening are, are like this at all, but it's, do you actually work with them? Cause you love every aspect that they do and who they are and understand their personalities, or are you working with them because you know that they make decent money and you can charge decent fees and provide, you know, a great service to them? Or would you better be served finding a different niche that you truly are passionate about, that you live and breathe that niche and you're reading their publications, you're deep into what they have going on. It's fascinating to see with the pandemic and just being so consumed with physicians that we're seeing a lot of of uprising with the physician community about how poorly they're treated and the lack of PPP and the lack of leadership. And, it, you know, this is something that I, I read because I enjoy it and it deals with 100% of our clientele, not 30% of our clientele. Talk to us about what, like what switched and changed. You know, you said you, you like, you launched in 2016, you weren't that niche focused you ground out eight clients in the first year because it's it's pretty brutal for almost everyone in the first year. Turns out all eight of them were physicians. Still terrified to call it a niche, though. What changed? Like, was there a was there a moment? Was there a transition? Was there like a eureka inspiration moment? What what switched for you from I got started and I was terrified to call it a niche to now I'm all in on this thing? The most honest, direct answer is I got out of my own way. I mean, that's, that's the truth. I was terrified to change a bunch of stuff over to make it physician focused, to do the website. This is the third edition, by the way, of the website. This isn't the first edition. This is a third rebuild of the website. Most advisors slap together a website themselves because you're bootstrapping it, which is what I did in the beginning. And then I hired a professional to do the second one. And then I hired another professional to do this this third time to keep, you know, defining what I want and what works, what doesn't work. But I, I essentially just said, I got to go all in. And if this doesn't work, I can always switch. I can always fix it later, but this is who I want to work with. This is what I wanted to do. You know, at the previous advisor I worked with, I told them I wanted to work with people like my wife and myself that were early career physicians. They, uh, all of our friends kept asking me questions that were around their student debt and around just their the investments that they have in their 403B. I mean, my wife and a couple of her friends all thought the 403B was a scam. Like, so they didn't want to invest in anything because they thought it was just, they didn't understand. They've never, they've literally never taken a finance class. And this is, my wife had like a perfect score on her ACT and a perfect score on her SAT. Like she's brilliant in multiple publications. When we first met, it was, oh, I just make the minimums on my credit card because that's what it tells me to pay. Like, no, no, no. Like, please don't do that. Right. But that's where they're at. And so I said, you know what? I got to get out of my own way. I got to just do this. And that's when I, I, and it really was the, the turning point was that XYP in conference backed up to FinCon. And I, you know, I said, yeah, you know, talking with you guys and a couple other uh, planners that are great friends of mine to this day and said, you know, I, I got to go in and then FinCon actually helped me understand how to do it. So like, a, you know, my clients have never been trained in finance. Like I never was trained in marketing or any of this stuff, but FinCon is what, what really helped spark that change as well. And just getting out of my own way and just doing it and just like, I got to go all in. I got to see how this goes. And even the first edition, or this, I should say the second edition of the website was not that good. It, it was still, I'm like kind of put my foot in the water, but I didn't jump in. And this is, this site now is we've gone jumping in with both feet. So I'm still wondering just like what, what got you to that point? Was it just like, 
I'm frustrated it's not growing enough. Oh, what the heck? Let's try this. Or or more of a pull of like, I've had some good experiences talking to physicians. Like, I think I'm going to go deeper and try to make this work. Like what, you know, what, as you put, like, what got you to get out of your own way? Yeah. So eight clients is what I had in the first year. We only finished with 20 something clients in our second year. Things were still really slow. And this website that you're currently seeing was built in the beginning of 2018. So I was basically two full years and going like, okay, this is kind of growing. But again, all 20 people were physicians. So I was hitting some of that clientele. I was getting some referral from current clients or people that would book a prospect call with me. And I'd, I'd tell them like, you're not the best fit for us. You're too early in your career or whatever it may be. And then they might refer someone in because I told them exactly who I work with. And I, it happened twice, which is kind of weird to me in this in this early period that I told someone, I'm not the best you know, advisor for you. Here's another advisor. And they went, oh, but my friend, I don't know, insert name, Jane, it, you're, you'd be the perfect advisor for her. And then they would refer that person and that person would start working with me. And so I was, that was kind of like, a mini wake up call that like, if I just tell people exactly who I want to work with, those people will show up. And it's an an interesting point that, that just when we get a, when we get a referral or an introduction, I think there's always this fear of like, but you know, but Bob referred this person. Like, I don't want to piss off Bob by telling them no. So like, I I take them as an accommodation if they're not perfect and, and sort of miss like, but if instead you say to them like, hey, I'm so sorry, I'm not quite the right fit for you. We actually work with people like this. I'll help you find another advisor that's a good fit. But just like, you know, here's here's who we actually work with that's best. You know, what ends up happening? Like you still honored the referral. You still got them to a better place. And now you have yet another person who understands exactly what you do do and can actually create more referrals for you in the future because they – your clients at the end of the day tend to respect when you'd clearly say like, Hey, I'm not the right fit for you. Here's someone who is, and then here's, who's actually a great fit for me that I can best help. Yeah. So you add that to, I really only want to work with this type of clientele. And now I've got people who didn't even pay me to help them. And I just was honest and said, this is who I work with. This is who I don't work with. And you know, here's a great advisor. And I, of course, go to XY Planning Network, go search whatever they're looking for, and I'll send them a couple names and they can go contact those advisors. But that was only coming to me because I wasn't clear up in my business card, if you will, right? My website, uh, that this is who I wanted to work with. And so that coupled with, you know, finally starting the podcast and seeing how much, you know, how many people I can actually help through that form of, of medium that really caused and sparked the, Hey, let's, let's actually jump in and, and just go two feet in and, and change everything around. And I mean, even our plans, Michael are very different. So if a physician's to meet with you as a, as a patient, they leave and they're going to do their notes and they do them in a way that's called a, a soap note, subjective, objective assessment and plan. And even our financial plans are built in a soap note. Like we truly cater to like having them understand their finances in any way that I could talk to them and get them to make the relation between medicine, which they're experts in and like brilliant to finances, which they're always feeling overwhelmed. And if I can make those connections any way I can, they're going to truly have a transformation, a better outcome. If, if I can do that. And so that's the, some of the messaging I took to put on the website, but also we, you know, we build plans that way and speak to them in, in that way when we're just meeting with them. What was it that was holding you back when you're at 20 something clients, all of whom are physicians, but still afraid to say you specialize in physicians on your website? It's, it was more like not knowing the marketing channels I think that are out there and what I should do. And I'm not the strongest of writers. Like I'm not, I'm a technical writer, but I'm still not even the strongest of writers. And so having trouble just sitting there looking at the site going like, how do I make this message sound clearer? How does this, you know, really portray what I want? That was very tough for me to even make that transition to let's address the copy on the site and, 
and do that. So I had to have outside help, help me get my message across. And it was a cost and that's, that's okay. Like sometimes we have to have costs in our business that are things that just, we can't do, or we can't do very well. And part of it was, was that, and just having the money to be able to afford someone that could do these things for me. Part of it was that realization of like, look, if I just tell people what I actually do and what I really want to do, then more of those people will just show up. And then as I made those changes, then it was like, oh, cool. This is actually working a little bit. Well, how do I get in front of more of these people? And that's where I think the story turns quite a bit to starting the podcast, the Facebook group, getting everything on the content side going, kind of turning on that that engine, so to speak. And and that's where I think the trajectory went quite different than the normal, typical advisory practice. Well, that to me is one of the things that gets so fascinating about sort of focusing into some sort of niche or specialization and 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 being willing to own it. Like I, I feel like it's been amplified in the pandemic environments that I see so many advisors at the end of the day saying, like, you know, we're we're ready and willing to take clients, but I don't know where to go, particularly in a digital environment when networking meetings have gone away. Like I don't know where to go to find prospects. Like how how do you how do you find prospects online? Like what what do you do? What's the what's the online marketing strategy to to you know, make the the proverbial phone ring when we can't go out and do and do marketing in person? And one of the most fascinating things to me always around niches is that when you get more focused and you know ex- exactly who you're going after, it suddenly gets a lot easier to figure out where to go to find them. And how to get in front of them? Like I even chuckled, you know, on the, you know, the main part of your website. You know, a lot of us are like, if we get any level of media exposure, we'll, we'll put like, you know, as seen on, you know, CNBC or Market Watch or or some consumer media publication we got into because we try to do the the social proofing and credibility and 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 your site says financial planning for physicians and it's like as seen in medical economics the new england journal of medicine the american medical association and white coat investor and just right all of these publications all of these marketing channels are like you know look if the average financial advisor writes an an article for medical economics or tries to speak or do something for the american medical association like it ain't resing. You're not getting any clients from a one-off engagement with one of those. But when you specialize in physicians and focus in physicians and are trying to figure out, like, I got to get seen by physicians a half a dozen different times for them to learn my brand. Here are all these different organizations, groups, associations, publications, and the rest that they read so I can get in front of them over and over again. Suddenly, the marketing plan to me actually becomes clearer and easier once you actually pick who you're going after, because it just gets more straightforward to say, well, what do they do and where do they look at stuff? I'm just going to go there. Like a bunch of them read the White Coat Investor blog. Fine. I'm going to figure out how to be on the White Coat Investor blog because if that's where they read, then that's where I'm going. And the more specific you get, the easier that actually seems to become. Uh, absolutely. And, and the avenues that open up when you start putting out the best content you can completely for free are remarkable. I get quoted all the time in different publications because they found me through our podcast that we're reaching, you know, a certain number of people and they get fascinated. They go listen, then they go, Hey, you know, you clearly know physicians. We have doing an article on, I don't know, medical economics. Like we want to get a bunch of quotes. Sure. Like I'm happy to do that. They come to me now Whereas that I never would have thought any of this would have happened because I didn't truly set it out that way and honestly believe in myself that I could build it like this. But it always comes from a place of helping. How can I help people? I mean, pandemic times, most people are stopping the content creation or just keeping kind of even killed. I decided to take questions from our community and questions that I get all the time. And I, I was literally doing for the month of April and a full every single day. I was answering a question and producing something for them and received dozens of people that were like, thank you so much for this. Like I only have a very short period of time between like 
work and passing out of exhaustion. And it's nice to know like you're nerding out on money and I can still learn a little bit about it. New England Journal of Medicine reached out. I've been a, a panelist of theirs for the last couple of years in their financial planning 101 series. That never would have happened if I was, oh, I work with doctors and dentists and CPAs and engineers. Like it doesn't, it doesn't happen that way, right? They want to, I want to. In Inman financial planning, we do comprehensive financial planning for anyone and everyone that we meet. Like it, it may be true and it includes every doctor, but no one's excited. Like no one at the New England Journal of Medicine is as excited to bring in comprehensive financial planner from Inman Wealth as they are to bring in, you know, the co-founder of Physician Wealth Services who runs the popular financial residency podcast. And that's really where it comes down to is just giving out is it sounds so backwards, Michael, especially when I say it again and I'm thinking of it before I say it, I'm going, oh, this is sounds so weird. But just give away as much as you possibly can to help that clientele. And the people that are DIY, right? Not everyone's meant to work with a planner. That's totally cool. Right. The people that are DIY, you're changing their lives, right? By providing this type of content, this education to them that they can go and impact. And I look at it as I if I help one doctor, I help thousands. Right. Because if they're not going to burn out or or get into to financial trouble because of something that I helped teach them and they never paid me a single penny, like that is amazing. That's like my life's work would be do- like is done right there. I, I I just love being able to help those people because they help and are healing everyone else, which is, uh, you know, obviously the domino effect is, is huge, but there's a certain subsect that go, man, that is, that's a good point. I never thought of X, Y, Z that way, but I don't have the time or desire or, you know, just, I don't want to be responsible and I need someone to help me. Well, I'm going to go to the guy that literally nerds out on this all the time. You know, we even had an interesting phenomenon at my prior firm where you know, we we sort of got a similar approach. Like I, you know, on Nerds I View, we just we publish a lot of stuff out there for a lot of people, in, including a lot of folks who are DIYers and just like they read it for themselves and they'll use it for themselves, but they're never going to do business with us because because they're DIYers. And you know, we we had someone I'll I'll, I'll call him Bob for you know, anonymity purposes. Bob's an engineer in one of the labs up in up in Maryland that has lots and lots of engineers and. He was a DIYer. He had like found the blog through Google at some point, although he knew our firm was local, was, was never going to work with us because he's a do-it-yourselfer. But because Bob was kind of like finance guy and finance guy with his friends, what we discovered ended up happening is like Bob likes to talk about finance stuff at the water cooler with a whole bunch of his friends who don't know as much stuff as he does. And so inevitably, his friends would like ask him for advice. And when their questions got too complex, he would say like, I, you, like, I can't answer that. You really got to go hire an advisor. You should go hire Kitsis. His firm's right up the street. Like, I don't work with him because I do it myself, but you need help. You should go work with him. And, and we actually ended out in this referral cycle where Bob sent us a material number of referrals over the years was never going to be our client because he was a do-it-yourselfer. But do-it-yourselfers have a lot of friends who are not do-it-yourselfers. And where it turns out where the DIYers go for information ends out being where they send people when their friends ask them for help that they're not comfortable giving. And it's like it's another version of that. When when you give information out, even in including to to do-it-yourselfers who aren't going to do business with you anyways, you you never quite know where and how that still potentially finds its way back to you. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. And to the point that if anyone's listening and and says, "Well, I, you know, I give out content," it it depends on the way that you're giving it out. And this might be completely backwards, Michael. I don't know if if I do this right, if I do this wrong. But on the podcast, which is generally where the bulk of people are coming, I barely talk about that I'm an advisor. It's not that I pitch my services every show, multiple times a show. I still get emails, and this is somewhat cringeworthy, like as being the planner, but I get emails and said, Ryan, I love the show. I've listened for the last two years. This is fantastic. I live in Houston. Do you know of anyone who does what you do in Houston? I'm like, 
I'm nationwide, man. Like <laughs> I'm I like, could be your planner. So I say, <laughs> I respond back and I'm like, you know, I technically can work nationwide. You know, if you're interested, we'd love to talk with you. If not, let me know and I'll connect you with someone, you know, that if you want someone local, I'll do a quick search and see if I can find anyone that would be local that could help you. That's fee only. Oh, and it responds back. Oh, wow. I didn't realize. Yeah, I'd love it. And they book a call. Right. So I, I still have plenty of people who don't realize that I'm even a financial advisor and, and maybe that's poor form, right? Maybe that's, but it, it shows that I, I truly just want to help this clientele. And if they need help, hopefully they ask, I mean, they might go off and find a quote unquote competitor. I kind of don't view that we have competitors because I mean, just there's 25,000 new residents that become attendings every year. Like I couldn't service 1% of those people. So if they choose someone else, like fantastic, I'm totally fine with that. But you know, it's, it's coming from a place of truly helping and providing uh, as much value as you can. And that's what gets shared. That's what people love. And that's where you're going to find people like your Bob that then, you know, use that and can refer it out or they see it and go, Hmm, maybe I just need to hire this person to help me. But that's not my intention ever. That is like, if that was my intention, I wouldn't have done a daily podcast or I wouldn't ha- go off three days a week doing the podcast because that they only need it technically one day a week if that was the case. And I'd throw a whole bunch of ads for physician wall services, but that's not where, where I come from. I come from a place of helping. And I think that that really shows. So when they kind of go through the, the cycle, right? The funnel of understanding like, Oh, these are free podcasts and free groups. And we just and actually released our book in the beginning of April, my wife and I co-authored it. And literally the book is trying to put me out of business. Like I'm not even kidding. It's how to build a financial plan for an early career physician, you know, going step by step, like they can build out a general plan. I want people to have this info because if they are more in tune with their, their finances and they understand it, they're still going to run into trouble when things get more difficult and hopefully we're there to help them. But the basis of financial planning, I mean, I think should be taught in high school, but physicians, they go through four years of high school, four years of college, four years of medical school, three years of residency, maybe even more, three years of fellowship like my wife did and receive zero training at all in finance. So I just keep trying to, to, to push out as much content as I can to help them. And I think that's, what's really been the catalyst to, for the hockey stick of growth is just being myself and just helping as much as I can. And we can talk through the numbers and what the stuff looks like if you want, but it's, it's really, a, I just want to emphasize the point of you have to truly want to help that clientele and it not be, Hey, I'm going to produce this so I can get X number of referrals or I'm going to do this. And, you know, every two minutes say how I'm an advisor and they need to work with me. It, it It's not, that shouldn't be the place where you're coming from. You said that you kind of had this turning point in in late 2017, like out at the XYPN live conference and and kind of deciding, okay, maybe I really, maybe I really am going to go off to this niche thing. And then and then being at FinCon, which for those who aren't familiar, is is the it's basically the financial bloggers conference. So so the sort of the broader community of bloggers who write personal finance content of which, you know, advisors are sort of a, a small subgrouping of that you went to the FinCon conference and got a lot more ideas of how do I actually get in front of these people. So so talk to us overall about like what the what the marketing strategy has been over the past few years or maybe even like what what did you start initially based on what you learned at FinCon and then how has it changed over time? Oh yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I'm learning all every day, constantly new things, not only in marketing and planning. I mean, everything's changing at at this point in the world, but that was in 2016 that I had gone to XYPN and, and to FinCon. And in 2017, I said, okay, look, I need to redo the website. I need to actually be more in focus with, with physicians. That's the, the firm's name changed, I believe is the end of 2016 or early 2017 to actually be physician wealth services. You know, I kind of, what, that what as, was it? What was it originally? Simple. 
simple wealth services. Yeah, just simple. So it was it was about building simplistic plans and just understanding that, you know, financial planning can be simple. And it was a, a really a horrible strategy uh, right out the gate. And it was just because I had no idea what I was truly doing. You know, I, I knew who I wanted to work with, but I didn't want to market to just them. I wanted to be able to technically help anyone if I could, but I really wanted to focus on that that physician. But I just was so terrified to actually make it niche that I went with something is so broad as as I as as broad as I actually could. And, and then two thousand. And what was the f- like? What was the fear? I just I'm so struck by it because you've you've I've noted this a few times. Like you were. You, you knew you were going after physicians. You were only getting physicians in practice, but you were terrified to to market to them or to market to only to them. It was not knowing what to do, not knowing how to, to to actually get a message across. I mean, I'd always worked with clients or in the beginning of, the, of my career, like behind the scenes. I've never ran a business myself. I mean, my family's a bunch of entrepreneurs, so I know kind of what goes into it. I knew what what pool I was about to swim in of craziness. Right, entrepreneurs were the only people that want to work eighty hours, so we don't work forty hours for someone else. But I, <laughs> I knew that I wanted to do this, but I didn't know how, and so I just said, "Well, I'm going to throw this out there. I'm going to just start. I just need to get moving and get it going." And then eventually, I kind of was like, mm, "That was probably not the best decision. Like, I probably should have been more focused on the name and the clientele and the message." And so, and then in 2017 or late 16 or early 17, I switched the name. I, I started changing the website around, ch- tried to change some of the marketing around. I had been a podcast listener for, I mean, gosh, Bigger Pockets launched their podcast years and years ago. It was like episode number five, I remember. So this is like 2010. I'd listened to podcasts forever, and but but I'm pretty introverted, and I I've wanted to start one forever, but the idea of pushing record and having it go out to anyone was kind of terrifying at the beginning. And so it took me uh, pretty much the whole year to build up the courage even to then go do that. And I launched it and uh, call it financial residency. And that was thanks to my wife for creating that name. And, you know, again, in the, in the niche of itself, and it was really slow to get going. And I did a lot of mistakes. I mean, podcasting is, as you know, Michael, very, it's a, a decent learning curve in the beginning to get things going and the connections and the software and the equipment and all of those things. But just the idea, right, of, hey, potentially hundreds of people could listen to me. That's kind of crazy. That's a huge room, right, that, that I'd be talking to people and what kind of content would I provide. And so there's just a lot of mental roadblocks that I've put up. And eventually I just said, you know what, enough's enough. Like, this has to happen. This is what I truly want to do. This is exactly who I want to help and how I want to help them. And I just need to get out of my own way and stop saying, well, what if this happened? Well, what if that happened? And I just need to be myself and put myself out there and help as much as I possibly can. And I believe that if I help enough people that people will turn around and actually seek the information that I have that I've been putting out and will allow me to help them go and craft their plan and live out their ideal life. So what did that podcast look like when you, when you first launched it? Like, what did you, what did you do at the beginning? How did, how did you get started with it? Oh man, it was, it was so tough, but it was one of those that, and I leave my first episode up there because sometimes I feel like I don't make enough change. I'm not improving. And then I go listen to that episode, probably listen to it two dozen times now. And I'm like, oh man, that was really bad. That was really bad. I've come a long way from that. So it then immediately picks myself up and I keep going on my on my day, on my work. But it was, you know, just trying to map out like who I could have on the podcast that maybe had physicians that followed them. So there's some physician bloggers and other podcasters. And then it was, you know, what other type of industry people do I love? I'm a huge fan of Sarah Falaw's work. I've had her on the show a few times talking about behavioral finance. And and then it was some episodes were just me answering listener questions, going through some of the key topics that they need to understand. Turns out that I have 
now several advisors that listen to the show, uh, which always makes me chuckle a little bit because they're trying to figure out how they can better serve their clients, which I think is is amazing. But it, in the beginning, it was really tough. I mean, just being able to consistently produce content and knowing how to produce it. I mean, it, there's a there's a pretty big learning curve in addition to like getting out of my own way and not being terrified that you know someone's actually going to be listening to the stuff that I'm pushing out. But some other blog, you know, um, advisors do this in the form of blogs. They're better writers, so they enjoy writing more. Clearly, you enjoy writing, so you're you're going to obviously put out some fantastic content with that way. I, I have that, but it's not my strong suit to to do more blogs is not my my aim. It's really podcasting and talking and interviewing people that can bring value. So it was it was it was tough getting started though, but I'm so thankful I I just said, you know what, I'm doing this. I'm getting out of my own way. I I pulled a bunch of our friends who are physicians and said, what do you want to learn about? What can I talk about? You know, and and I asked them specifically, I pulled like 50 or 60 of our our friends that are physicians and they actually picked the name funny enough. So you love the name, Michael, Physician Well Services, but it wasn't my top choice. That was the overwhelming majority loved this name. So I chose this name. I put out about eight different logos. They picked the logo. I said, it it doesn't make any sense of what I love. It's what do they love? Interesting. And so as you started building in this direction, where were you going for information, just trying to figure out what what am I doing and how am I doing this? Yeah, are you asking in terms of like the marketing piece, uh, or are even just kind of building the podcast and figuring out how to get it going? Yeah, there was I mean some really great resources through the FinCon group. Like I I, I can't thank them enough, PT and, and their whole group for really helping. It, you know, they're I would just ask questions in their Facebook group. Honestly, say hey, I'm looking at doing this. How does this work? What software works with this? I did hire an editor because I realized really quick that it, you know, a 20 minute show took me two and a half hours to edit. I don't want to have that time, but two, I don't enjoy that work. So I hired an editor who I was thankful was able to give me, you know, some pointers on how to get better and what not to do and what to do. And really, I, I leveraged that group and the amount of amazing people in that group to help me through that piece. And can I ask like, who did, who did you, who did you hire as the, as the editor? Is that someone that's in the business of doing it for other, other advisors and podcast interested folks as well? Yeah. So I, I launched with a gentleman named Steve Stewart and he helped edit the show and give a bunch of great feedback and, you know, was able to leverage his like expertise and then as this grew and I had a little bit more coming into the business that I could put back into making the show a bit better or my social presence a bit better, um, I did hire someone that could kind of help me navigate the world of social media and marketing, so to speak, that really leveraging their ex- you know, experience and expertise to, to this type of, of, of venue that I was doing, which was podcasting in the Facebook group. And I think having those people in my corner were extremely helpful in what we were building and what I was doing. I'm struck as well, by just the willingness, the comfort to, to go out and spend on this stuff. Like I, th- I think for a lot of us, one of the biggest challenges and pain points around like trying to go this direction is just I don't know that I've got the time to do it. I don't know that I've got the expertise to it. I'm not I'm not even sure I've got the expertise to figure out who to hire that has the expertise that you seem to have a a certain willingness or comfort to just say, look, if I don't know how to do it, like I'm 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 gonna spend some money and hire and find someone that can help me do it. I mean, wouldn't we be hypocrites if we couldn't say, Hey, I'm not smart enough to do XYZ. Let me go find an expert to go help me achieve that so I can hit my goals, right? I mean, that's one of the whole things that whoever, I don't care what clientele you're using, right? Or or you should say what niche you're in or what clientele you're trying to attract. If you tell them, hey, I'm an expert in this and you're not, and that's okay, but I'm going to help you get from A, where we're at, to C, where you want to go, right? And and to be able to live your ideal life, to hit your goals, to do what you want to do, to live an amazing life. 
hire me as the expert to do that. Like, why would I go try to bootstrap everything myself? Now I, I get there's DIY people and I could be that, but I'm not necessarily, and I, I am totally comfortable saying it. Like I am not an expert in everything. I am not the smartest guy in the room and I'm cool with it, but I want to find the smartest people in the room to help me in whatever I'm deficient in. So then I can help more people, more physicians be a better version of themselves and to have a better financial life. So I was able to, to be fortunate that again, I'm married to a physician. Granted, she's a pediatric pulmonologist. So she, in the physician world, she's pretty much at the bottom of the pay scale, but nonetheless, she's still a physician and we are, you know, not super crazy spenders. So we can absolutely live and save off her salary. And that means everything that came into the business, I could actually go put out into making the business, the actual business better. And that's essentially what I had done is just keep reinvesting into things that I don't know or understand and just get out of my own way and just do it and just do the work. And that's, that's really where this comes in, right? The whole iceberg and concept when you, you laid it out and I just, I kind of chuckled because it's like it, all it is, is just doing the work and doing it in the right way. And if you don't know what the right way is, find someone that can help you and then do the actual work. Well, and I, I'm, it's an interesting point that you make of, you know, part of the dynamics and getting launched in an advisory firm is, is, you know, having a plan for the household income of just how are you going to, how are you going to make the math work? How are you going to pay the bills and keep going while you're building the practice that, you know, being this framework, we can live off of my wife's salary, not just while I launch the business, but with enough of a runway that even as we start growing and generating some some profits, I can reinvest that back into the business to do more podcasting, marketing, whatever else it is that you're that you're trying to do to grow is you know is is part of the I guess like the overall household strategy about how do we build and and turn this into a business. Obviously not everybody is necessarily in a position to have a a spouse where the math works to be able to do that, but that you know, when you're able to get the household finances to the point of doing that and and kind of free up a little bit of the pressure on yourself that it's not, I have to figure out how to get 42 clients in my first 12 to 18 months to put food on our table, that, you know, it, it, it gives you room to be able to reinvest to do some of the things that you're doing and not always have to bootstrap everything yourself or, or DIY everything because you just literally have no dollars to hire anybody to help. Yeah, I would have started the firm a year and a half, maybe even two years earlier if I had more runway, but we were very diligent and I've had to move into a lot of things for my wife's career. So she w went to med school in Kansas, which is where she's from. I was in Southern California doing my ma both my master's degrees and then we moved to I moved to Orange County, uh, which is actually where I grew up, but I moved from San Diego up to Orange County cuz she did residency there and then in three years, we moved down to San Diego. Um, and of course, then I moved down there because she was having her fellowship for three years. And so there's a lot of moving around, a lot of pieces. And I would have done this earlier if I had the runway, but I didn't. But we we were diligently saving so I could launch my own practice because I knew what I wanted to do and kind of the crowd I wanted to help, even if I was afraid to kind of publicly admit out and kind of put my message out because I'm so anti-sales, Michael. Like I hate the word sales. Like to me, it just always feels slimy, like the, the that concept. So I think maybe some of my hesitation to put out that I was really just wanting to work with physicians, maybe kind of stemmed from that. It, it really, I, the best way I can just put it though, is I was just in my own way. I was in my own head and not, not letting that piece out was, was probably a really poor decision, but I'm happy that I was able to get away from it, but I, I would have started the firm earlier, but I needed that runway. And then when she started working as an attending and we could afford a little bit more and a little bit nicer stuff, but we still save enough and, and hit all our financial goals. Um, Cause again, we don't spend a ton. So that allowed me to you know, really reinvest back in the business. And I invest that back into making everything I can about the business better, whether that's technology internally on software. I mean, we leverage lots and lots of tech on our end, or it's, you know, making, you know, 
the podcast bigger, better, more powerful, or hiring someone that can help me with social media because I tend to get frustrated with social media. So, you know, having, you know, my message being crafted a little bit better or even just copy on the website and who did, that. Who did you hire to help with social media? I feel like that's a, a pain point a lot of people have and it sort of feels weird to let anybody else like quote unquote do your social media. Yeah. So her name is Desiree. She's amazing. If anyone wants contact info, just email me. She's fantastic. And when I say do social media, really what what it is, is I know what I want to say. And so I'll either craft the message and then she'll edit it and make it sound coherent and correct. Or she would take her best stab at saying, hey, I know you want to talk on this or mention this. And then I go through and I edit and I approve. And then she's helping me schedule those things. She's not out there like typing on behalf of me. I know lots of people that do that. That's not what I'm trying to create. I want authentic uh, you know, engagement with people. But leveraging time, right? It's just leveraging time with money and expertise. So she's much better at writing and copywriting and understands how to frame messages better or when in our Facebook group, I mean, we've got five, 5,300 people, I think physicians that are in that group now, you know, crafting little writing prompts and helping get them engaged. I, I'm not the best at that. And I'm okay admitting that, but she comes up with these ideas. I review everything and then she schedules it. So I know, and I'm saying everything in my voice, in my tone, I know what's being said but I'm having someone on the team now help me make sure that I'm consistent and that I'm still providing value. So that's what I had, had done, you know, with, with that in terms of, you know, just again, putting more money back into the business. But one of the hardest things about launching the business was there was a lot of information and you guys at XY Planning Network put out fantastic stuff. I mean, that, that was one of the things in 2015 that, because that's when I joined was October 2015, I want to say. Can't remember exactly, maybe November, but it was the content you guys were producing around starting your own practice and making it relatable that I could do this, you know, was was really helpful. It was a little hard when it was, hey, you could start, it was, I think it was Sophia's post. It was like, you could start it for $10,000. And I, yes, I wish that would be yes. the case. <laughs> on, on- a, a somewhat infamous post. Well, I mean, to be fair, like she did get her firm launched for for under ten thousand dollars. She she did what I guess I would I would probably now characterize as a as a lean launch. Like she she was very lean in the in the expenses and the stuff that that she that she put in the pl- in place. Like it it does to me make an interesting point overall that I think your your story illustrates well that. You know, for advisors getting started, I mean, whether you well, whether you manage to do it under ten thousand dollars, like Sophia did, I think more more advisors I see probably end out in kind of the ten to twenty thousand dollar range. Just by the time you get some compliance support in the tech you need, and a website stood up, which usually isn't cheap, and a few other areas where you may get contract help, but it's it's like it's your household expenses, it's your personal upkeep that buries most advisors and. And keeps them from having enough enough runway, enough staying time to actually get to critical mass with clients and 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 make it work. Which it sounds like you guys were very mindful of with like having a runway and savings and and being able to live on your uh, on your wife's salary while you were getting started, so that you know the the personal upkeep wouldn't be your downfall. Yeah, that was absolutely critical is to make sure that that wouldn't be the downfall that I could keep reinvesting back in for as long as I wanted or needed to, to find better help or just as we grew, you know, it's one thing is you're growing a client a month and bringing that on. And there's another thing when you're growing at eight to 10 clients a month and how much you have to think ahead. And it gets, it gets very challenging, um, you know, navigating the, Hey, sh- how much should I keep paying myself versus this is going to be at an unsustainable level in three months. Uh oh, like time to make some adjustments, or in six months make more adjustments. So it's been, it's been a challenge. Uh, I will say a very different, and I'm very fortunate to say that, you know, we're helping so many people. But it, from an an organizational standpoint of headcount and who are, you know, having to train people and how much work we can actually do without working hundred hour work weeks. You know, it's been, it, that's my new challenge right now is not necessarily the, the launching, but now it's the managing crazy growth 
and it really stems, I think, just from that podcast and really helping people as much as I can. So, so talk to us about kind of the the marketing process, the growth process that exists today. So you've like you've mentioned the podcast, you've you've mentioned uh, uh, blogging, you have mentioned a Facebook group with thousands of people. Like, can you can you explain to us what the it's like what the marketing process or funnel is of like how are you getting clients today? How does all this stuff work together to to make business happen? Yeah, so the podcast goes out in normal times, I will say, two times a week. Monday is more of a technical show. Friday, we do what we call them like our FHAs or financial health assessments, uh, where we just have listeners call in and we we tell them, hey, this is what we see. This is what you should look at. And obviously disclaimers all across the board that you know this is not a financial plan. This is just trying to help the community navigate the process. And we really showed them on that show what financial planning is. A lot of people get confused and think it's just investments, right? It's, I don't have enough money to invest, so I can't work with a planner. Whereas this show, uh, we've, we've allowed people um, or helped people to understand the maybe some of the pitfalls that they have when they see someone else's scenario. So that has been fantastic. I tell people all the time to join our community and it, I pretty linked it. So, uh, or, you know, basically made it to where um, if you, so I'll just say it on air, financialresidency.com slash community, right? So if someone was to go there, it actually routes them right to our Facebook group. And that allows them to come in and to join and to see there's thousands of people just like them listening that they can ask questions. There's a community aspect to it where you can crowdsource some of this information, if you will. I chime in and kind of give my in, you know two cents into some some things, but um, really, I, I let them have their own community. And it's not necessarily about me. It's about them. And then the blog kind of goes together where we take a transcription of the podcast and then we rewrite it a little bit to flow more like a blog. So the website's continually getting updated with content, but really the content started from just like how you and I are talking right now on a podcast it would just be a straight transcription. And then this poor soul that would have to go through our, our long, long podcast here would probably want to cry, but our, uh, my general podcasts are about 30 minutes long. So they're going through and then converting that over. And that's Desiree that helps me with that. So we pay for a conversion or a transcription, I should say, we use rev.com. They go through, they use their AI, I think, to transcribe it. We get a file back and then Desiree goes in and tries to help me make it sound more like a blog post. I review review it, I edit it, and then we post it. And so when you get all these pieces together, it's just a lot of content to help people. But it's, again, those people, like if you come from this of like, not just screaming, I'm an advisor, come work with me. If you just come at it of here's all the content that I think you need to be aware of based on where you're at in your career. And these are the things that are happening. And, or I just had someone on, we were talking about the changes in disability that the, the big five are really doing for physicians that are on the front line. And that is really information that they need to know right now because they, I mean, they were wiping the idea of you don't need to go in and have labs done. They're going to just pull EMRs and, do a, a much more extensive interview and give people up to $35,000 of monthly benefit on their disability. Like that's huge for a, a physician to understand. Cause if you maybe had a little bit spotty record, you know, that you could have this type of, of coverage because of the times we're in and the insurance companies are willing to do that. So it's time sensitive information as well to just provide benefit. And they know that if they, listen, they read, wherever they're finding the info, that if they want to work with us, they know where to get a hold of us. It's at the bottom of every page that they can, you know, hey, maybe we're a good fit. Click here to learn more. And they do. And it goes right to Physician Wealth Services. Interesting. And and so can you give us a sense of like what the, I guess, what the volume or activity is? I don't know if you measure it by like people in the Facebook community, podcast downloads, blog hits, like what, what do you look at for metrics to figure out like, are, does this have a reach? Is it working? Are we, are we getting to what we want to get to? Yeah, I think that's a, a great 
question. So last year in 2019, we averaged about 21 people reaching out every month to inquire about how we could potentially work together, how we could help them. Again, I don't, my sales quote unquote process is not salesy. They sit down, they meet with us. I ask them, you know, about their story, get to know them a bit, try to figure out if we are a good fit just because they're a physician doesn't mean they're a good fit. And then I either say, Hey, this is the services we can help you or we can't. And let me refer you to someone else. And that happens quite frequently that we want to make sure that they're in the right, the right stage of their career, because we found that working with physicians and only physicians that about 80% of what they have going on is identical or in this, you know, really close in the same periods of their career. And so we can actually help them because we've seen this literally 20 times this month go through in terms of the, the 2020 metrics, like we've, we're averaging about 32 people a month that are reaching out and booking calls um, from physician wall services. And you know, I, I, that really, I mean, we track where people come from because on our Calendly link, when they book, we say, how did you hear about us? And a, a good majority of those people are coming from the podcast or the Facebook group. We do have one ad that we pay for that's on the White Coat Investors blog that we get some traffic, but not too much traffic from. And then we obviously get referrals as traditional practices know, like as you get bigger, you just happen to get more referrals over time. So we're seeing more referrals come in as well from current clients. And then I, I do, obviously we can easily log into Libsyn, which is the hosting company for the podcast. And um, I'm not sure when this technically airs, but we're at about 650,000 downloads um, since inception. So the podcast has been growing month after month over month, which is awesome and fantastic. We saw a little dip for this pandemic because a lot of the people that we're talking to are off saving our butts from the pandemic. So they can't listen as, as much, but I get it. And, and I know that. for, for a lot of people, they listen to podcasts while they're driving. And so in a world where we're not commuting as much also has, has reduced podcast listenership for some. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, when I stopped driving an hour each way, which by the way, my commute was only seven miles. Thank you very much, San Diego. You know, my podcast consumption went down considerably uh, with that. So I can only imagine that the only podcast quote unquote that they're listening to is probably their kids screaming in the background as they're trying to get work done at this point. But so I think it's natural that we would see a little bit of decline, but in terms of downloads we did, but for people who are reaching out and actually signing on April of 2020 was uh, our, our best month. We helped more physicians than we've ever helped in a single month. So it's, it's something that it's been challenging from a, you know, the human standpoint, right? I've got kids that are home. I'm all of a sudden I've become a teacher, which I've learned that I'm not well equipped to do. And I hope people truly learn that Teachers are underpaid and and I think uh, not respected enough for the amount of time and effort that they put into our kids. So I've, I'm very thankful of our teachers that help and I can't wait for them to start actually being a real teacher again and not me faking to be a teacher for my kids. But just with the amount of outreach and the family aspects, I mean, it's I've honestly never worked harder in my entire life, but I'm fortunate and I love, truly love what I do. And I think that comes back into being able to finally help the people that I truly want to help. When you talk about podcast activity, you said 650,000 sort of downloads over the years. Like how many, how many episodes have you done? Like, what is that? What does that translate to? Like how many people listen to a particular or a typical episode of which you're generating like 30 plus prospects a month. Yeah, probably like 3,500 downloads a show is roughly, I'd say the average of where we're at now. It just depends. I mean, those daily shows had a lot less downloads because they were five minutes long and I was just literally playing a voicemail of someone who left it in and then would answer it or I would read their question that they had emailed in or put in our, our group. I kind of blew that uh, episode. I know how you do episode numbers. I kind of blew that out of the water this month with, uh, or in April with the 
daily show, but I get about on average like 3,500 downloads. So this is not in terms of size. This is not Joe Rogan, right? I'm not millions of downloads. This is not even probably your show that that's, you, know, you don't need a huge audience to serve who you want to serve and to work with it. If, if, if 10% of the people that listen to my show reached out, I couldn't service them. Right. I mean, think about that for a second. Like I can't service 90% of the people who listen to me multiple times a week. Like if that was truly the case. So it's, it's a, it's a fascinating thing. And you just have to come at it from that mindset again, because I see a lot of people, a lot of advisors reach out. I've coached a couple advisors to launching their own podcasts. It's something I do on the side just to help people usually coming out it the wrong way. I want to produce this to generate X business. And I'm like, it, it could happen. It's going to be a while till it happens, but you have to come at it of, I want to help this segment, this niche, get through their issues, their problems to where they go, man, you know, Michael, I've, I've been listening to him for a while and he's got these really long form podcasts and they're fantastic and they deep dive into all this. And it's really helped me learn. I need to, you know, kind of pivot here and there. The next time an advisor says a question, I'm going to be like, go check out Kits' podcast. It's fantastic, right? They don't have to necessarily even be a client. Like how we're talking about your- Yeah, like Bob, right, Bob wasn't a client. He was yeah. a person that people, that other people ask questions and advice about. And and he pointed them to to us, even though he wasn't going to use us directly because, well, he, he used the free stuff. He didn't use the paid stuff, but he still referred people who paid because- some people are do-it-yourselfers and and some are not. But you still helped him, right? You helped him oh, absolutely. get through what he needed and he was appreciative and he referred business to you. And and the I love the podcast avenue because you can't fake it, right? I know that you don't fake it on your blog because I know how you are. Yeah. But, it, would, but, well, it, would, yeah. it would be a whole, like... If you just want to fake it, like that is a horribly time ineffective way to go about faking it, like giant multi thousand word blog posts. <laughs> exactly. Right. But you, in theory, could have someone write that entire post and we would never know, in theory. Like, right. So, but you can't fake a podcast. I can't fake Michael Kitsis's voice being, you know, or my voice on, on the Kitsis podcast. You can't fake that. So people get to really know you. And I, I love the doors that have been opened from the podcast, but I also love the different conversations that have happened. And some of it was really weird. In the beginning, it was very weird for me when someone would meet with me across the, the Zoom call here, because um, I work remotely, remember, with everyone. So the pandemic didn't change anything that way, the way that we work in our, our business. But I'll start talking like, hey, I'm Ryan, nice to meet you. And they just start laughing. I'm like, what do I have like something on my face? Like what's going on? They're like, no, I've heard you so much, but I've never seen your face move and your voice come out at the same time because I don't do video. So it's like very different for them to see and hear me. That was, you know, just those type of things are, hey, I know you had recently moved and done this because I bring my wife on the show and we talk. Um, she probably comes on like every four or so months. And so they know uh, generally about us. So there's the conversation is just very different. It's not making sure that I'm a real human being and that I'm not a scam artist or something where they're very skeptical going into any financial planner and interviewing them and just very, they're on high alert, right? All these people who are looking to work with planners are just on high alert, which is, I think, okay to do that. But it's a very different, more relaxed conversation about how we can actually help them and are we the right fit? And immediately the conversation within 30 seconds is getting into that, the real good stuff, not let me vet this guy and see if he's, you know, your gal, see if they're real, see if they're trying to, you know, pitch one, you know, that I'm not going to know what's happening. That all goes away with having, being more vocal through, through a podcast. People could do this through YouTube as well. I'm not the best on video. It's something I like to get better at, but I'm, I'm just not, and that's okay. But I love the podcast form. And one thing else before we switch, Michael, on, on the podcasting piece is that it opens up doors that would never have come up. I, I personally don't think that I would have ever had opportunities that have come up. I've had different types of interviews that have been fantastic that went to bigger publications. I spoke at 
John Hopkins residency and UNC's residency. I'm speaking to a bunch of Air Force physicians in the upcoming month. Just different residency programs are reaching out because they listen to the show and they go, can you help us? And immediately I could be like, yeah, and I charge for it. Or I could say, you know what, let me just help these people. And if they want to become clients at some point, cool. And if not, no worries. Like it, it, the more that I'm keep putting out, the more that I'm helping, I, I truly believe that it comes back. And that's, I, you know, I just, I, I keep wanting to, that was the message I want to make sure I got across is like, yes, there's a lot of content. Yes, I do a lot of things, but I'm doing them for the right reason. And I hope people that are producing content and, or decide to take some action today and starting a podcast, that'd be fantastic. We need more advisor podcasters. Right? We need more great content coming out from people who understand finance and that aren't just winging it, uh, so to speak. Right, We need that, that your voice is out there. So hopefully people kind of take away that you, put, you need to put it out for the right reason, though. Well, and I am struck that just uh, like the math of it is interesting that you know, you're talking about numbers like 3,500 downloads per show and and five, 5,000, 5,500 people in the Facebook community. And, and like on the one hand, just that's a lot of, that's a lot of people, right? It just like, if you, if you imagine them in a convention center, you just filled like a significant portion of a convention center. I'd be terrified, Michael. I'm terrified to talk in front of 20 people, right? Like that's a lot of people. But in the, in the grand scheme of things though, like it's not that many people for some of the bigger podcasts, so well, that that's the thing. Like as you said, you know, like, uh, Joe Rogan's millions, and like you know, there are radio shows that. Oh heck, I I know advisors that do radio, and it's like, well, you know, we we only want to broadcast in markets that have at least uh, half a million people or more, because otherwise, we don't think the po- the radio show can get enough reach to to generate a sufficient volume of of prospects. And here you are talking about a you know a podcast with thirty five hundred downloads per show of, of a regular audience bringing in 30 prospects a month, which if I do the math, like is, is 360 prospects a year. Like I, I know not a hundred percent of your business is coming from the, the podcast, but like basically you're turning 10% of your podcast audience. Like you're doing 350 plus prospects from 3,500 regular listeners. Like the numbers are astounding to me in that context. Like I, you know, we, I see a lot of advisors that will do, you know, spend thousands and thousands of dollars to do, you know, buy lists to do marketing strategies, to like do seminars in the hopes that 1% of the people you sent to the list just even show up for your seminar. Only a portion of them will even take a follow up meeting and only a portion of them will become clients. Like we, you know, we do these broad blast like marketing strategies with seminars and the like, where, which I think is sort of our roots as advisors. Where at the end of the day, like if 0.1% of the people who get your mail or do business with you, you're actually doing pretty good on your conversion and you're living in this world where you might get 10% of the people who are listening to your podcast becoming prospects that want to do business with you. And that's growing and compounding because you're, you're up 50% from your average from last year. Like it's, it's, it's compounding and building for the same effort. Yeah. And it, it comes again back to like, I, I, most people I know that I'm an advisor, but I, I truly get at least four or five emails a month that are like, Hey, can you help me find someone that's like you, but in X state? Like I truly get those emails. And so that should show like that I'm not promoting our services all the time. I did promote our book because I was very proud of the book that my wife and I put out and you know, she worked hard on, I worked hard on it. So we did promote it a couple shows in a row, but even then, like it wasn't down their throat 14 times in the show. Like I just, I listen to some people who are selling products and listen to their shows and I get immediately turned off because 30% of the show is a pitch of a product and, or, or more. And I, you know, I look as uh, it, some people, the only time I talk about being an advisor is in my disclaimer. Like, I don't know you from this, go reach yeah. out to this. We're advisors. We're not your advisor. Like I give a custom yeah, but disclaimer. Like, hint, unless you want us to be your advisor, in which case, <laughs> please go to this website and contact us. That's exactly it. Like I, that is exactly it. I don't 
overly promote. There's some shows that I do that I think are very relevant to what we're doing as an advisory practice and where we're showing the most benefit that we really can, you know, provide a, a big difference and a valuable difference and a valuable service to them. But for the most time, like you're hearing about us being advisors through our disclaimer, like which no one listens to, you know, I mean, we, we want them to. So I even have been doing it twice now in the beginning and the end for a disclaimer, because I want them to understand that. Again, it wasn't always this way. Last year, we were getting on average 20 people. This year, we're averaging a little over 30. The year before that, it was not even anywhere close to 20, right? It was, it was much, much lower. So it is compounding, it is growing in that respect. So, so help us understand what the, what the advisory firm business looks like today. Like, where does it stand now for clients or uh, assets or revenue or however you you measure overall size of the firm? Yeah. So as you can imagine with student debt and the physicians that we work with, our average client has $298,000 of student debt, essentially. Um, we have- <laughs> Average um, client has $298,000 of debt. Of, of student debt, not, not to mention like auto or mortgage or- personal loans that they refinanced credit cards out and then got into credit card debt again because they never learned that that was a very bad idea. We have some, Michael, upwards of 700 plus thousand of student loan debt. So I've I've obviously become a quite a nerd with, with student debt and we go through a lot of that. But I have advised on well over $40 million of student debt, whereas our firm collectively manages like $12 million of assets, right? Because we work with early career physicians that don't have a ton of money. They have a higher income or earning potential, don't have a ton of assets and a crazy amount of debt. That is, that's really the bulk of our clientele. So, so how does this work from a business model perspective then? Like hard to hard to make a living on AUM fees on $12 million. Yeah, the AUM model wouldn't work. And I, I'm not a huge fan of the AUM model, honestly, but we charge a fixed flat fee to work with us. So we, if you have a million dollars or less, it's $500 a month to work with us. And if you have a million dollars or more, it's eight thirty three a month. And the way that I am viewing that is that I don't feel like charging more for money, uh, to manage money until you actually have enough to manage. And I feel for us to truly make a difference. Now, is there a big difference between 900,000 and a million? No, but it just makes a clean, easy break for us that if you, if you have a lot, enough money, then we're going to charge you a little bit more. But if you don't, and you're building your portfolio up, like it's a fixed flat fee to work with us. And so, so as I think about this annualized, like it, it's six thousand dollars a year to work with us, or if you've got more than a million dollars and some additional investment complexity, it's ten thousand dollars a year instead of six thousand because mm-hmm. you got some more stuff. Yep, and that's only on assets that we manage. So if you have a bunch of money in your four hundred one k, like we're not including that. It's just truly assets that you that we manage it, and we use TD Ameritrade Institutional. And you chose to do it monthly as opposed to charging a a six thousand or a ten thousand dollar annual retainer. Yeah, because most of them couldn't afford that, right? If we look at the clientele that we're working with, they're usually zero to 10 years out of training. The longer they go out in training, we've found that the less actual cash flow that they do have because they call it lifestyle inflation. You go from making, just for those that don't work with physicians or have any want to work with them, they go from making like fifty, fifty-five thousand dollars $55,000 a year in their training residency or fellowship to making two hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand dollars depending on specialty. Lower paid specialties make, you know, one seventy five to two hundred, but for the most part, we're seeing people that make around two fifty and up. So they they have this high income potential, right? And they start like growing into that income. I always say, you know, more money, more problems, right? And then all of a sudden they go, Oh, oh we thought we could do this. We can't do this. We need help. And it's usually the longer that we go out in training from their training, the the less that they can actually afford, they get in that monthly payment mindset. The newer attendings that are that just got that bump, they could technically afford it. But I, I like the idea of, you know, just being able to to quote them one easy fee monthly. That piece just mentally makes more sense for me. We're we're toying with the idea of tossing out that if they wanted to pay quarterly or semi-annually that we could give a discount to those people, but not make it required because 
It's something that I want them to see it. I don't want this to be buried in their account statement from the brokerage and them to not know what they're paying us. I want them to know that they're paying us and I want them to reach out for help. Are you are you still billing their investment accounts in order to do it? Or are you actually billing them directly even though you may be managing money for it? We use advice pay. So we're we're billing everything through advice pay. You know, being members of XY Planning Network and not having the the monthly fee on advice pay and it, the simple ease of use of of it, it really helps. And so we just have everyone set up on advice pay and it bills them monthly and takes care of all of that for us. And again, leveraging technology, that's just one piece of tech that we're using, but leveraging tech is super important to us to be able to handle not only working with everyone remotely, but then at scale and across multiple states, even just internally, we're all in a different location. So what do you what do you do for clients with very little assets and you're charging them six six thousand dollars a year? I mean, I think we sort of get the the clients with more than a million, it's ten thousand dollars because just even in traditional AUM terms, like that's kind of a a one percent AUM fee. They've got a bunch of stuff. I think most of us look know what that looks like. But when you talk about like five hundred dollars a month, which is not a trivial number, like six thousand dollars a year, and most of them, it sounds like, have significantly more debt than assets. Like, what do you do for five hundred dollars a month? Yeah, no, it's totally cool. Great question. So, if you think about where they're coming out. A lot of them are on the wrong repayment plans for their student debt, which if you magnify that over hundreds of thousands of dollars, that, that can get quite messy quite fast. So we're looking at, you know, obviously student debt. It's it's really a done for you platform. That's our inpatient planning. We're, you know, helping them analyze their, you know, their bank accounts, their their spending. We're literally we're giving them coaching on that spending. Um, some of them have such issues around spending that we're meeting with them monthly to, to help them on that spending for 30 minutes to check in. So in the first year of working with us, we go through a five meeting structure to deliver a plan. That usually happens within about the first three months. And then we, we meet with them quarterly on different things that we're implementing whether they're doing a bulk of the work and we're helping or we're doing the bulk work and they're, they're assisting just depends what it is. I need them to go run quotes. We don't sell insurance, right? Then we're going to analyze it. We're going to tell them what they need. We're going to help them get it in place by working with that agent. You know, there's, there's lots of pieces that they have. They're starting blank slate. They have nothing done and they usually don't have a lot of time to get it done. So they're paying for our time to help implement those pieces to actually make sure that the plan that we're building in that three month period over those five meetings is actually getting completed and they're actually making progress to it. So they, I mean, it isn't the cheapest, it's definitely not the most expensive, but it isn't the cheapest service out there, but it's because we're meeting with clients at a minimum nine times in the first year. And and is that all like face, well, uh, pandemic aside, was that all face-to-face in-person meetings that, that are, that are that active? Uh, like what is the, what does the meeting process look like? Since, as you noted, like they're they're busy and you're trying to save them time. So I would imagine actually getting them to meet sometimes is the challenge. Uh, of course, so we do everything through Zoom, right? It's that's why the pandemic didn't really change the way that we work and operate. Everything's done through Zoom, and um, they're usually sixty minute meetings. We do have one meeting that is usually 90 to 120 minutes. We, I am a registered life planner. I know you've had George on, um, George Kinner to talk about that. Dan, who's also on our team, has gone through that training. So that is typically our, our second meeting is the longest meeting talking through their goals and what they're doing, what they would like, you know, what their ideal life looks like, ideal schedules, all that great stuff that George trains on. But yeah, the meetings like are, are typically done through Zoom. And then if, if they need it, um, where we go through and do a, a, a bigger deep dive, if you will, on their, their spending, like we use uh, YNAB, you need a budget, and we have them basically start implementing pieces of their budget we're reviewing. And we actually do mon- uh, the monthly cash flow reporting for them. So if they're, they send us their export of, of their YNAB, we turn around and say, here's your net worth. Here's how this changed. Here's what your 
cash flow looks like. And for the clients that truly need it, we actually meet with them and help them with some of their behavioral side on spending. And we have clients, I mean, not everyone's like this by any means, but we have clients that hide packages as they make purchases on maybe Amazon too much. So they're hiding packages from their spouse or they're doing certain things that we're trying to help fix those behaviors. So it's not just financial help. There's a lot of behavioral coaching that goes into some work with with some of these clients. Talk to us a little bit more for a moment about YNAB, because I, I, I think a lot of the people in the advisor community are not are not familiar with it. So can you talk about like what is YNAB? I guess like how do people use it in general? What are you actually doing with it in an advisory firm context? Yeah, this has been a huge pain point for us because cash flow is, I think, the, the basis of the planning and to get good, accurate data has always been tough. We tried e-money, we tried right capital, we've tried all sorts of different softwares and just they haven't been able to really nail it for us. Because like where's the gap? It, like because connections break, because they don't categorize properly, like where's the actual gap? All the above. I mean, connections breaking is is obviously a huge issue and they all kind of experienced that with Plaid and I think they just bought Quovo and the other one, the connections in from banks to connecting to the software is like, they're all using kind of the same stuff. But what happens when the connections break? Do transactions actually get ported back in? Are transactions missing? If you can't depend on that data, then any analysis you're doing is immediately faulty. Right. So being able to trust the data and the idea that things were getting categorized. So one of the big issues with the Imani that we had was things are getting categorized incorrectly. And even if clients are going in and stating this is this is what it is, it was automatically just always putting them into whatever that was. And necessarily that's not always the case. So clients were getting frustrated having to go in and recategorize and redo everything over and over and over again. You couldn't just I, that, that's fine because like I'm a, even for our household, like we're mint users and have been for a long time. Like it's a standard feature in mint. You just like click a little button that says, you know, always recategorize these identical transactions this way in the future. So you don't have to keep fixing them on, on an ongoing basis. Yeah. We found that with e-money, they would do that, but it, it wasn't actually doing that. And we just saw that over hundreds of households, the, the hundred plus, we work with 140 something people now. And we just see issues with, we had used a software called Tiller. And the issue with them was everything was perfect. It was actually in a Google sheet. It connected everything. It was all nice and pretty from a spreadsheet standpoint. One, it was kind of intimidating for clients, but I think that was okay. The big issue was, is when, when transactions, when the, the connections would break, the transactions would disappear. And they wouldn't come back and we couldn't depend on the data and they couldn't figure out what was happening. So we've transitioned to YNAB and we've been using that for a while and you you need a budget. It's YNAB. And the nice thing about that was that it doesn't let you budget, quote unquote, out money that you haven't earned yet. Whereas traditional, like even on Mint, you could say, I'm going to earn $10,000 this month and here's how I'm going to budget it. YNAB says, you only made 5,000 of that. Where is that 5,000 going? And then when you make another 5,000, where is that actually going? And we've found that for the clientele that we're working with, that actually to them was even easier to understand than, oh, I have this huge pot of money. Let me allocate it. Oh, wait, I actually don't have that money in my bank account yet. So it only allowed them to work with the data that is actually there, the money that is actually in their account. So it's it's a big change from traditional budgeting, but I think for our clientele that works out really well. And you can then go in and, and set your categorization. It does remember it's it's pretty intuitive. We haven't had any data go missing, which has been fantastic. Um, because that was that was a huge pain point. And ultimately, like is this still sort of automating like data flows and categorization, or you're just like pulling bank accounts and then you categorize where you're spending your money. But at least once you tell it where it went, it does it consistently. Like, yeah, it's, it's the, basically that the actual it, tech it, once flow? you tell it where it's going, it does it consistently. And then you can budget the amount of money that you actually have versus a future amount. And then what we do with clients for the majority of them, they don't need um, a ton of help in this, I would say not a majority, maybe half of them don't need monthly help. 
where we're going in and they don't have issues with saving, you know, they're able to pay all their bills, whatever it may be. And so we're asking them to, to click three buttons to export it and to drop it into our Google drive. And then we combine the, a net worth statement plus uh, showing them exactly where their money went. And then we can show them how they're doing it along with their peers. Cause remember we work with 140 some odd households of physicians. So we, take the data, make it all percentages. Everyone's got the same budget categories. You might have subcategories that are different, but the same high level categories are there. And then we're able to send them out and say, hey, look, the average physician that we work with spends 28% of their take-home pay to debt. You're spending 22% or childcare, right? The average person spending X percentage, you're spending Y. And that's really eye-opening and has changed a lot of behavior with clients when they can see across the board, physician couples that have kids, this is what they're spending. Oh, wow. That is quite eye-opening. We were double that, let's say. And you're comparing that across your client base, anonymized basis, but like the, you're showing them the average, the what they're spending relative to the average of your clients. Yes. Yeah. I mean, how else would I get the data if it was physicians in general, right? But but with size and having the specific niche, that is a big value add to them because now they can see truly how their peers are without having to see obviously names or anything like that. Everything is just, it, we just take a, a percentage and just say, like it doesn't have any other detail other than that. But we show them in a bar chart, like this is what you spent this month. This is what your peers spent. This is what they spent this quarter. This is what you spent. So you spent last year. This is what they spent. And they can see percentage wise how they're spending in relation to other families. And so when we talk about their goals, we can have a better dis, you know, discussion around, well, your goals are to tell us you wanted to do more in travel, but in reality, you're spending 8% of your take-home pay in Amazon and you're only spending a fraction of that in travel. Like we're misaligned. How can we get back in alignment? What can we do to not have you spend so much on Amazon? And like Amazon legitimately has its own category because everyone spends so much money there. So it's it there's it nothing like just you click the button and it shows up in your house. It's a glorious thing. Right? You spend the money, you push a button and like, oh, I got something. And then in San Diego, pre-pandemic, it was here in two hours. Like there's like two hour windows. It's crazy with what they were doing. So a lot of clients have that issue. They're busy, they're working, whatever. They order a ton on Amazon. And when we can come back and break out this analysis for them and show them, and this is why I think we charge what we charge, because this isn't like you're going to meet with us once or twice a year. And we're, we're, doing, we're helping you fix behaviors. We're coaches and accountability partners in addition to advisors. And there's a lot of work that we're putting in with clients and a lot of FaceTime that we're putting in with clients to do this. But I am struck, like, it sounds like by and large, uh, intensive in the first year, and then essentially a quarterly meeting structure thereafter via Zoom. That's like, that's the anchor point of the service model. Yeah. And we tell them, I mean, obviously reach out with any questions. We are proactive in our communication and we get a lot of people that that do send us emails that we use um, a service called Loom, L-O-O-M. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it, but it allows you to like record your screen and your a little bubble of your video or you could be all of your video and we use that to respond back to um, a lot of client questions so we're hoping that we're engaging them more by seeing video of us you know or being able to share a screen and help them specifically with something and and how many clients now are are in the business uh i think it's we're at 142 clients which is just striking to me overall like you were eight clients and 2016, 20 clients in 2017, yada, 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 two and a half years later, 142 clients. Like that's a, yeah, it's, it was kind of a la hockey stick leap. Yeah. That's yeah. It was, it was a really big change and, and it was a really hard growth to manage the growth of it. We work a lot. <laughs> we, we truly do work a lot. We had 59 clients that joined us last year and you know, as we're recording this, which I don't know if this ruins it for you or not, Michael, but we're at April 19th uh, recording this and we've we've brought on 36 physician families this year. 30, 36 new clients in three and a half, almost four months. Yes. And all just driving on, this is the compounding that starts happening because you focused 
into saying we're just all in on physicians. The website says it, the podcast says it, the community says it. When we immerse into them, they're showing up. Yeah. And we just do absolutely, I mean, as much as we can for not only the people who don't pay, right, that we want to help, but the people that do pay, we help them as absolutely as much as we can. And I mean, holding different hours, you know, like we're, we're available when they are. And that's, that's a huge convenience for them that, you know, as we go in and, and you, at the beginning, you were kind of like, oh man, how do, how do they, why would someone pay $500 or, Hey, that's just quite a bit of money to pay. But it's, if you look at everything that we're doing and the amount of FaceTime that we have and the amount of flexibility that we're giving them. And the fact that we do only work with physicians and we know their pain points, sometimes I feel like it's cheap in what we're doing. And I am struck though, because I feel like this question comes up a lot when talking about this model. Like you don't have issues of you're charging me monthly, you're charging me five hundred dollars a month or more, and like we're not meeting monthly. Every once in a while, we get someone that's like, hey, we haven't met this month. What's going on? It's like, well, do you have something that we, you'd like to meet on? Like, Just because we're meeting quarterly doesn't mean that they couldn't book a call for 15 minutes. We call them uh, quick consults. And if you have something going on, like, let's meet. Like, it's the, the door is open. But we typically are telling them up front, this is the way we work together. Five meetings up front, quarterly calls. If things come up in You send us an email and it's a question that we need to talk with you on. We're going to send you back and say, book a call like as quick as you can. We want to go over this. So we're okay meeting them more than that if that's the case. But again, it really depends on on the clientele and um, who most people like their lives don't actually change so much. They have like a weighty financial issue every month, 12 months of the year. No, not necessarily, but they're, they are implementing big financial changes all the time, right? Because we're looking at people who have nothing put in place. They have no estate planning. They have basically, and they maybe sometimes have never even started an investment account and are just sitting with $300,000 in cash in the bank because they don't know what to do. They have no disability, no term coverage. They haven't even signed up for their employer plans yet. Like it really just depends. I mean, I had someone, Michael, it gives me kind of a little anxiety saying it, but uh, they didn't know the bank password. They just said, if I never got an email that said I overdrafted, I'm good. I don't care. Right. It, it just, it depends on who you're working with, right? Personal finance is personal and how much care is needed for that person. And some people are, need more help. They need more help. They need more one-on-one touch points to help them. So they don't, you know, go off the rocker and start spending a crazy amount again. And you know, we're here and I don't charge them more. It's a fixed flat fee. And you don't feel any weirdness of like, we're charging $500 a month for people that have hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. Not necessarily because I mean, uh, our family had that, right? We had, my wife had $125,000 of debt by the time that we left public service loan forgiveness, because we knew she wasn't going to work for at least several years for a 501c3 it ballooned to like 180,000 we've been there it's kind of i look at it as like they're buying a business right the business is just in their head with great cash flow uh, that they're doing but no if 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 i had an issue with student debt if we weren't providing any value then I, i wouldn't have any clients because pretty much every single client has student debt but they're making good money and they need a lot of help and they don't know necessarily where to go. And part of what we're doing is dissecting that student debt. Like it, I mean, I'm, I care to, to admit on air how much I know about student debt, but it's way too much. Like I wish it was a lot easier um, and that, that people didn't have to pay people for their expertise and advice and in, in taking out debt and to understand what they took out. But the repayment plans are difficult to understand and filling out the paperwork and just knowing Hey, should I file jointly or file separately? Because I've got debt and my spouse doesn't or does and how that, that interacts. Like it's, it's a difficult process, but no, if I, if we didn't charge anyone or work with anyone that had student debt, we wouldn't have any clientele and this segment of the population would not receive any benefit from financial planning because most of them upwards of, you know, 10, we have clients that finished training 12, 13 years ago and still have debt. And they weren't actually doing anything with it. And now they're in a bigger hole than if they would have worked with us, you know, if we were around 10 years ago to do that. So I, I know there's a huge value. We've saved clients tens of thousands 
hundreds of thousands of dollars on their on their student debt. Just recently with the new um, laws that were passed, March 13th, 2020, most people don't know that it's retroactive from when they put it in. So if your clients have made any payments since March 13th, call the servicer, get the refund. Um, I know that we've saved tens of thousands of dollars for clients that had that. And we, we reached out and said, hey, heads up, you've, you've made a payment on auto with pay on the 20th. Go call them, get it back. Oh, thanks. That was 2000 bucks they didn't have. I mean, there's just little things like, like that that we can provide benefit for. So no, I, I don't feel bad charging when they have student debt. What surprised you the most about trying to build your own advisory business? Uh, how hard it was. How hard it was. My my family's a bunch of entrepreneurs. They've, I mean, I was the first one to graduate college, much less grad school on both sides of the family and the parents and uncles and aunts. They all run really successful businesses and are, are amazing entrepreneurs. And so I was like, oh, I got this. My mom could do this. My uncle could do this. I, I can do this. And just knowing <laughs> how hard it is to start with no book of business. And yeah, we had some leeway in terms of savings that allowed us to do this, but and it is it is very tough to start a practice and to know who you're working with and what you're doing and you know that was that was probably my only big complaint on on XY's side Michael was how easy it made it seem versus the reality of starting it and doing it and living and breathing it and you have to be truly committed to growing your practice and know that it's going to take years to get there and that was the hardest part yeah. Well, I, I still try to warn people as much as I can if you're if you're going on your own. Like it takes three years. It 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 takes three years usually before you really feel like you're getting going and getting traction. I think even in the context of 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 your business, like eight clients in year one, twelve more in year two to get up to twenty, you made the shift in year three. And I imagine really got the pipeline starting to go, but it sounds like it wasn't really until after the third year that you got to the 59 clients last year, you know, annualizing at 100 this year. Even in your case, it, it took three years before the momentum was really there. Yeah, it was really three full years. And I work on average probably 75 hours a week. So it took three full years of doing that for it really to, to come out. Now, granted, I, I didn't come with a book of business. I didn't have any contacts that I could reach out to. I'd worked at other places, but they were working with people that were 60 at the youngest and most of them were 70 and 80 that had you know million dollar minimums like they weren't the clientele that i wanted to work with i loved working with those people they were fantastic people but just wasn't what i was excited to get up and do every day and to talk to every day so it wasn't like i started with anything and that piece of starting from nothing to hey this this actually can work i mean it took three full years to go wow i actually I actually made it. Like this is an actual business now. So, what was the low point for you in the in this journey? I, I think it was in that in the beginning parts of hey, this is hard. This is what I want to put together. This is this is what I'm doing, and me constantly going, mm, maybe I shouldn't do that. Mm, no, I don't want to be out there. I don't want to. I'm afraid to talk in front of people. I don't want to go and make a local practice and building up you know, centers of influence and, and that piece, or, Hey, I don't, I want to start a podcast. Well, what if people actually listen, <laughs> right? What if people actually listen to the podcast? Now, all of a sudden I've got an obligation to people listening to me. And, you know, what if there's, there's a lot of them? What if a hundred people, like Michael, this is seriously how it went. What if there's a hundred people listen to me? That's a lot of people. Like if I had a people, a room full of a hundred people, that's a lot of people. Like I'm pretty introverted. That that piece was really hard for me to, to get through. And then I realized that I'm probably talking to that many physicians already that aren't clients and that haven't become clients that are just friends of ours through med school and residency and fellowship. And they're all asking me questions on how to do certain things. And that's when I was like, you know, I, I really have to just get out of my own way. And I think that was the hardest thing was to push fear aside and to just be myself and to just get the work done, but to not get in my own way. Anything you wish you'd done substantively differently? Like, is there some, is there stuff that you know now that you wish you could go back and tell you from, 
five years ago to have made this easier. Yeah, I would have started the podcast earlier and I would have actually understood how email marketing works. Like that, like from a marketing standpoint, those two things would have been game changer. I'm still learning stuff about podcasting and about, you know, marketing and about the way that, that I handle the business. I would have, honestly, I wouldn't have started this by myself. I think I, I like the having someone to ping ideas off of. And I, I absolutely love Casey. I'm so thankful that I have her, you know, as part of it. And now Dan's, you know, been working with us full time and, and, you know, another person that, that, you know, we can bounce ideas off of, but it's a lonely business. If you're by yourself, it's a very lonely business. Even though you're talking to people all day, every day, you can't talk to them about, Hey, I've, you know, I'm exhausted. I worked 14 hours yesterday putting together plans and, you know, can you take this call for me? Cause I'm tired, <laughs> you know, or something like just having someone else to do it. So I, I, I wouldn't have started this again by myself. Sounds weird, but I like having a partner in this. And I think it, I, I wouldn't have, wouldn't have wanted to embark on this journey by myself. I would have, I would have done it again. I, if I was to do it again, I would do it with someone. How would you have found them? That's a hard one, right? I mean, I got lucky that an XY planning member, which I won't say his full name, but so thankful of, of Joe, he introduced me to, to Casey and, you know, we struck up conversations. She ended up flying out to meet with me. And then, you know, it was, it was a, a great fit. We, I talked to other people prior to that. I would say you'd have to join some organizations where like-minded people are around to be able to to do that. And before you launch your firm, I mean, I'm assuming you're also working in the industry. I mean, I would use lunch and networking and I mean, obviously virtual calls at this point, but I'd, I'd be networking constantly if you want to start your own thing and you potentially might want a partner. I mean, I would start as early as you can in, in the planning of that. To me, I, I just, I, being by myself for a few years and now with a partner for a few years, I, I could not imagine going back to being by myself. It would be, it was, I, and I didn't, what I didn't realize during that time is how actually lonely it was creating a practice and doing all these things and not having someone to help with workload and help with, you know, bouncing ideas off of. And I launched in it was like you called it the spring launcher group from XY planning network with a couple guys, Mike and, and Patrick and Tim. And I still meet with them every week, five years or whatever later. I'm surprised they still hang out with me, but like so thankful that I have those people and that kind of helped bridge the gap. But a partner is very different than a, a, a weekly mastermind of, of, you know, a group that we get together. Well, it's one of the reasons why I've always pounded the table in general of like, from early in your career, join professional associations, whether it's you know, FPA or NAPFA or, or whatever your organization of choice is, and don't just be a member, but like get involved, get active with the organization because it, it's how you build your professional network of people that may or may not someday be the person that you go out on your own with or form a business with or form a partnership with or merge with. Like we get there lots of different ways, but you know, the, the only thing I know for certain is that if you never get out there to build your network, you, you almost certainly are not going to find that person. Yeah. And I was lucky that, you know, I, I told you before we got on, like there's, there's pros and cons to X, Y and, and being a member. And this is definitely one of the big pros is that, you know, I was able to find someone that I meshed with personally, that we saw eye to eye on the business level, that we have different strengths and different weaknesses which is really helpful. <laughs> we both can't be good at the same thing and bad at the same thing. So, you know, I was just, I was really lucky that I was a part of that network that then allowed me to network in and find my partner. And what comes next for you? Honestly, it's saying no to more things. I, I'm like, a, Hey, I could try this and Hey, I could, you know, let's test this and let's see if we can help people in this way or that way. And I think a lot of what I have been trying is, is, working. Some stuff does not work. Obviously we've talked about stuff that does work, but there's plenty of things that don't work or whether it's to help people or just mentally for me, like a daily podcast. I know that was helping people that did not work for me. That was very, very, very tough for me to do. But I think it's just being more focused on providing the best 
advice that we can give, the the best service that we can give. We're we're constantly trying to figure out how we can do things better and leverage things better. We are using Google Sheets to really manage a lot of our stuff. We don't have a traditional CRM. We're not using a traditional, you know, financial planning portal. We've built this out in house. And one of the things we just implemented was, you know, being able to to call in with this like voicemail feature where you just click a button and it it uses the software speak pipe in case Michael you ever had people you wanted to have call in for the show or whatever. And they just push the button, it pops up on their computer, they record their answer, they push submit and it goes right to us. And then our script kind of pulls it into that Google sheet that is their dashboard. And that has been a huge, huge hit with clients that were allowing them to reach out to us more frequently and to get better quality advice from us before waiting even for that quick consult in two weeks. It allows us to get to that answer much quicker. So as we wrap up, this is a, a podcast about success. And, and one of the themes that always comes up is even just the, the word success means, means different things to different people. So you're on this incredible growth trajectory curve now, 140 plus clients, most of which came in the past two years, you may you know, double in the next 12 to 18 months at this pace. So you're, you're, you're certainly on the successful and rapidly growing business track, but How do you define success for yourself at this point? Doing what I love, being excited to go to work and being able to work in my sandals. Simple as that. Like just working with physicians. Looking like a true San Diegan. Yeah, there you go, man. Like it's, you know, I work out of my house. We built, it sounds terrible when I say it on air, but we built a, a shed in the back. It's 10 feet by 12 feet by 10 feet tall. And I made it actually into be like a podcast studio. So it's got double drywall. It's got a window and a door and the usual things. But, you know, I I work out here from my house and, you know, being able to spend time with my kids and do pickups and drop offs during normal times and be able to help physicians across the country that are just like my wife and in in my, my own family. And to, and then to be able to wear sandals at work is, that's it. That's living the dream right there. I don't, it doesn't matter necessarily how many, you know, downloads or how many people in my groups or all that. Those are all great that we're helping people, but it, you know, I get more joy out of helping one physician when they email and say, thank you so much. You've changed X, Y, Z for me. Cause I know that I just not only impacted them, but the thousands of patients that they're going to impact. And that, that to me is, is fantastic. So those are kind of the ways I view success. I love it. I love it. I guess pandemic mode has just forced everybody else to live your your reality of working from home and being able to work in sandals. Yeah, bummer, huh? It's. It, I, I think it's fantastic, and we've had people that have solely chosen to work with us because we were virtual. We've also, though, on the flip side, like not all not all rainbows and sunshine. People have chosen not to work with us because we didn't have a local presence. They wanted to literally shake the hand of their advisor. And those people aren't great fits and that's okay. And those are the ones, you know, or some of the ones that, that we tell, Hey, I, I can't be of service to you, but I will find someone. And usually I go in the network and on X, Y and find someone that can help them and make the email introduction. Well, awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan, for joining us on the financial advisor success podcast. Oh, excited to be here. It's uh, one, of the, one of the life goals, Michael. So I, I appreciate you having me on and letting me talk about some of the fun nerdy stuff that we're doing. Absolutely. My pleasure. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of success as a financial advisor? Check out the leading financial planning industry blog, Nerd's Eye View, at www.kitsis.com, where Michael covers the latest practice management trends and financial planning strategies. And by joining the members section, you can earn IMCA and CFP continuing education credits along with exclusive member content. Get it all now at www.kitsis.com.